who's going to be presenting today. Uh, Sunana is, uh, well, she did, she studied here in um, McAllen, Pan Am University. She did finance, in, um, and then from there she went to Austin, and she did consumer behavior, a PhD in consumer behavior and marketing. And I'm very proud to always call her Dr. Savannah Chigani, but she gets really upset at me, but she <laughs> earned it, right? <laughs> I earned it. <laughs> wow. Where so, um, did go right there? <laughs> so anyway, um, so we were able to convince her to, um, she's doing research on happiness. Relationship between consumption and happiness. Consumption and happiness. Relationship between consumption and happiness. So uh, we'd like for her to please come forth and uh, tell us all about it. Sunana Shigani. I currently live in New York and I'm just grateful to be have a job that I can travel when I when school is out of session so I get to be here and um, get to speak to you guys about this work that I do and um, this this what I'm going to be presenting today is actually a combination a drilling down of two separate lectures that I give my business students so it's a two and a half hour two and a half hours of material drilled down to 20 minutes which is what I'm going to be presenting um, today <clears throat> So there's actually a lot of depth in this, but I did have to drill it down a little bit. So if any of you are interested in chatting afterward, telling me what you think, I would love to hear, love to learn from you guys. Um, what I'm going to be sharing is going to be a combination of research that I do, research I've read, and my own experiences um, exploring these kinds of questions. And so I'm really excited that I get to share it with you today. So um, it's called The Power of Enough. And um, I wanted to start off with a note about, I'm sure all of us are familiar with the overwhelming emphasis on this obsession with more in our culture. We want more, we want more. Whether it's a bigger house, fancier car, um, more comfortable um, home surrounding, more prestigious job, more romance. We're kind of surrounded in all of our, um, the messages we get from the radio, from TV, from the internet. Buy this, buy this, you need more, you need more, you need more. So it's a very prevalent thought in our culture. And the problem with this type of thinking is that it doesn't correspond with the science on happiness. If you think about happiness, you can imagine it as being a pie chart. And all the differences in people's happiness you can put in a pie chart. And you can explain these differences in people's happiness with different things. Um, break it down into three parts. This is what the research says. Surprisingly, only 10% of people's differences in happiness can be explained by life circumstances. So all of that time we spend running after more, more money, more romance, so on and so forth, only explains 10% of what makes people happy. We're going to spend more time talking about this, but let me tell you about the rest of the pie chart. 50% um, is actually determined, unfortunately, by a genetic set point, fortunately or unfortunately. So depending on how happy your parents are, that influences how happy you are, kind of 50% of your happiness. Um, the last 40% actually, fortunately, is um, determined by what we think and what we do. So 40% of our happiness is in our control. I'm going to talk more about that section of the pie chart in a second, but let's take a second to look at life circumstances. Why is it that life circumstances only account for 10% of people's happiness. So first of all, money does matter when it comes to happiness, but not as much as you may think. 
So if you survey all of the Americans and you look at those who are in poverty level versus middle class, you will see an increase in happiness as you move from poverty level to middle class. So Americans making $50,000, by the way, household income, not individual income, household income $50,000 are happier than households that earn $10,000, for example. However, when you reach the middle class level, the relationship between happiness and income 100% disappears. It's completely gone. So Americans earning, for example, household income of $100,000 are as happy as Americans who are earning, say, $5 million a year. The relationship completely disappears. So it looks like a chart like this. Starting off at poverty, going to middle class, there is a contribution to happiness. But after that, more money does not equal more happiness. And just a reminder, even though this influences happiness, this is still 10% of happiness, right? It's not all of the explainable happiness. Also, material products matter less than you think. If you go back to the 1940s, one third of the homes did not have running water, indoor toilets, or bathtubs and showers. Half of the homes did not have central heating. But if you ask those people how happy they were, their life satisfaction, the average was 7.5 out of 10. Now fast forward to today, where we have exploded in how many material products we have available to us. The typical home has running water, two or more baths, central heating. Homes are twice the size as they were in the 1940s. We've got fancy things like microwaves and dishwashers and iPads and iPhones. And our personal income has more than doubled from the 1940s. But if you survey people today to ask them, how happy are you, life satisfaction wise, they say the average now is 7.2 out of 10. So that's not a significant decrease. The point is it's exactly the same, right? We've exploded with our material possessions, but happiness hasn't changed. Why? Why is it that our material possessions count for only 10%? What we have counts for only 10% of our happiness. This is actually specifically what I study. It's called hedonic adaptation. And it's a powerful, it's a pervasive force, and it's kind of biologically hardwired in us. We are, um, we are animals that adapt to our environment. And so what hedonic adaptation is, is the following. You anticipate going out to buy a new product, and you're excited, and you go and you buy it. And when you first buy it, you first bring it home, you're really happy and excited with it. But what happens is as time goes on, that product, which was a gain to you in the past, now becomes part of your status quo, the reference point, what's normal. And because it's now what's normal, what's every day, it stops making you happy, and your happiness fades from that acquisition. So a good example is houses. So just say you live in a, a small house, and you make more money, and you're really excited because you're going to go buy that new house now. So you go out and you buy that new house, and the first day you walk into your new house, you're so happy, you have so much space, so much nicer than my old house. As time goes on, that new house gets incorporated into your reference point. It becomes normal, it becomes a status quo, and if you measure people's happiness, the happiness just fades over time. So that process of incorporating things into your reference point is called hedonic adaptation. The same thing happens for losses. So if I had a medium-sized house and I was forced to move into a smaller house for some reason, in the beginning, it'll hurt a lot and I'll be sad and upset. I miss my old house, I miss my old house. But as that new, smaller house becomes the status quo and the reference point, your sadness and your dissatisfaction fades and it becomes normal and you're fine. So your happiness depends on your reference point and that's true over and over again in the research. So this guy is really excited because he stood all night in line and got the very first iPhone that got released. And um, there's research that actually shows that for a certain group of individuals, specifically materialistic people, they actually get more pleasure from anticipating buying a product than actually buying the product. Because before they buy the product, they're super excited about all the things, they can imagine all the things a product is going to give them. Then when they get it, almost immediately hedonic adaptation sets in. They have the product, it starts becoming part of their reference point, their status quo, and their happiness fades with it. So you can actually see people are happier waiting for that product than when they actually get that product. Pretty interesting stuff. So, so this idea of we want more, we go out and we get more, and then when we get it, the happiness fades. So then we want even more, and then when we get it, the happiness fades. We want even more. Psychologists call this process a hedonic treadmill. Because you keep walking and you keep walking, but you never really get anywhere, right? So it's like a treadmill. You keep walking, you never get anywhere. So for example, those with salaries under $30,000, if you ask them how much do you need to be satisfied in life, they say I need $50,000 to be satisfied in life, on average. If you survey people who have salaries over 100000 
how much do you need to be satisfied in life? On average, they'll say I need about $250,000 to be satisfied with life. So you can see if I'm, and by the way, I've heard this from business people all the time, <coughs> entrepreneurs. They start off saying I want to make this much money, and then when they get there, they realize they need a little bit more. So they work harder, they kill themselves to work harder, and then they get that more. And then they realize they want more. And I'm telling you from personal experience, I've heard this firsthand from business people who tell me. The Sedani Tribal really is a real thing. So how do we get off this treadmill? If we're on this treadmill all our lives, we get burnt out, we stop focusing on things that are more important in life, we neglect our social connections, um, we are chasing after fleeting happiness, right? If I keep chasing after more, the happiness keeps fading. How do I get off that treadmill? And that's where kind of this personal philosophy of mine um, comes in. I'd love to hear what you guys think about it later. Um, I, I call it the power of enough. Because no matter how much you have, if you compare yourself to somebody who has more than you, or some idea of more, you will never, never be happy. Because happiness is determined by a reference point. If your reference point is something that's more than you, you're always going to feel like you're unhappy. So I have come up with this little thing called the power of enough. And I try to think about what is enough for me? How do I define enough for myself? And how do I set that as my reference point? And I'm going to give you an example of what I mean. So I told you guys I currently live in New York. I live in about a 450 square foot studio apartment. And when I first moved in, I was really happy. It's got these huge windows. It's close to work. Luckiest girl in the world. You know, I get to live in New York City for a while. And first on my job, I'm independent and free. Super lucky girl. <clears throat> Couple of months down the road, some new neighbors move in down the hall from me in this apartment complex. I met them. They're really sweet, really kind. I kind of really like them. I thought it would be nice to have them around. Then one day I was walking to work, I walked down the hall to the elevator, and they happened to leave their door open. And I just happened to glance inside the door. And what I saw was gorgeous floorboards, really dark brown floors, gorgeous soft lighting, really beautiful cabinets. And immediately my reaction was, my apartment sucks. <laughs> I, was, you know, I really did, I was thinking in my head, where can I go to buy nicer lights? Who can I contact so that I can fix my floorboards? How can I change the cabinets? My apartment sucks. Re I study this stuff, so it's really funny. But, um, and then, just after a little while, I, I remembered an experience I had had uh, maybe a week before that. So it was winter in New York, and I was walking home from work, and it was nighttime. And I remember passing, right, walking down a street, and there were these, I happened to glance down on the ground, and there were these two women kind of curled up in a way to kind of conserve heat, because they didn't have, um, they had one blanket. And so they were curled up like this to conserve heat, and they had erected a cardboard box in front of them to keep the wind out, to hopefully, um, so they weren't that cold. And they only had one blanket, so only one woman had a blanket on her. And um, it just, struck me how lucky I was that I didn't have to worry about how cold it was going to get that night. So it was snowing and windy and it was just really cold. And I knew that I didn't have to worry about how cold it gets tonight because I have a warm, nice place to stay. Who knows what these women are thinking. They're probably praying, please don't make it get too cold tonight. I don't know how we're going to survive the night. So um, I remember that, that um, experience and immediately I realized the fact that I wanted to fix up my apartment the way that I wanted to fix it up was just absurd. That's the exact word for absurd. How could I not realize how wonderful life was and how could I then want more, right? So for me, enough became a warm place to stay. And not only did I have a warm place to stay, I had so much more and so I felt rich. Because now my reference point is just a warm place to sleep, right? So how do you set enough as your reference point? and compare only to that. Not, who cares, I don't care what the TV tells me, I don't care what my cousins have, I don't care what my friends have, I know what's enough, and I know that I have more than that, and I am so grateful, right? So, um, no matter how much you have, apartment in New York City, no matter how much you have, there's always more that you can have, and you'll never be happy if your reference point is more. Um, and anchoring on enough helped me stay grounded, and, and it grateful. And there's another experiment with enough that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, some of you probably have heard of the organization called Service Space and Nipun Mehta, because Nipun Mehta was actually one of the opening speakers for Elizabeth Gilbert. We had this event a while ago with Infinite Love. 
Anyway, I had made a bunch of service-based friends, and they all live in Berkeley and Oakland and California, so I went out to visit them. And I, I went from house to house, so I was visiting for the first time. And the first house I stayed at, they welcomed me so warmly. It was kind of a studio-style house. We ate dinner together. And then when it became nighttime, there was this couple that I was staying with, I realized, wait a second, there's no bedroom. Where are we going to sleep? So they brought out a mat, and they laid it on the floor. And then they set up stuff for me on the couch. And I was like, I don't have to sleep on the couch. You guys sleep on the couch. I don't mind sleeping on the floor. And they said, oh, no, no, we sleep on the floor. Um, my wife grew up in India in the villages, and she's just used to it. So we thought, yeah, we don't need a bed. We'll just sleep on the floor. So I was like, huh. I don't really need a bed, do you? <laughs> then I went to the next house, and this was actually that flag. Pancho Ramos gave that to me. He is this amazing love warrior. He lives in Oakland, and he's working to bring peace to these, these gang-ridden streets. So I went to Casa de Paz, and um, I stayed with Pancho and his friends. And he took me to the room where I was going to sleep in. And it was an empty room. There was a kombucha brew brewing in the corner, if you guys know what kombucha is. And on the other side um, was just a small desk. And the rest of the room was empty. And he got some sleeping bags from the closet, laid it down, brought some more blankets, and laid it down on the floor. And I was like, OK, I guess I'm sleeping on the floor. And then as he's leaving, he turns around. He's like, you don't need a pillow, do you? And I was like, oh, of course not. Who needs pillows? <laughs> and then when he left, I rolled up my clothes, and I slept on my clothes as a pillow. But again, this experience was like, wow, you really don't need a bed, do you? So when I moved to New York, this is how I sleep. I thought I would just experiment with it. It's just a mat, um, one of those pillow top things, but instead of putting it on top of a mattress, it's on the floor. And I've got my pillow and my um, blanket. And it took me about a week to get used to this. Again, I just had to adapt, right? I had, that had to become my new reference point. It took about a week for that to become a new reference point, and now I don't even think about it anymore. The only time I think about it is when my mom comes to visit me, I was like, why can't you get a bed? <laughs> <laughs> or other people, but otherwise, it's, now it's the status quo, now it's normal, now it's enough. And the really beautiful thing, what I've realized, is now when I go lie down on my bed, I more frequently think, wow, I am so lucky to have a warm, comfortable place to sleep. It's this counterintuitive things that happen that by stripping down, I remind myself more about how much I actually have and how grateful, grateful I am to have so much. And you know, if I did decide to go get the bed, I could get one of the. I could get a fancy um, bed stand. I could get a fancy mattress. But I could still get more. I could still get memory foam mattresses, or I could get those mattresses that kind of sit up and go down to help you, whatever. Then I could get really. I could get really fancy sheets if I wanted. But even then, I just saw a commercial recently. Now Febreze has come out with sleep sensations. I think it's called that you can spray in the room so that when you sleep, you're, you're smelling this fragrance as you drift off to sleep. So there's no limit. There's always more. So for me, I anchor on enough, and this is enough. Right? It's a practice of gratitude for me. So David, Brother David, um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of him. He's a Benedictine uh, monk. He said, it takes more to fill the cup if you increase the size of the vessel. He said, gratitude happens in two stages. One is the filling of the cup, and the second is a spilling over. And when your gratitude spills over, you make the people around you happy. You spread love. And it takes more to fill the cup if you increase the size of the vessel. So these experiments that I'm doing is my way of trying to reduce the size of my vessel so it gets filled up um, and spills over more easily. So this power of enough, to me, is a beautiful way of bringing more power and freedom in your life. Because when you know that you don't need all of the things that people are, are trying to sell you, when you don't need what your neighbor has, when you can anchor on what's enough, it gives you freedom because then you can spend your resources, your energy, your time, your money on things that really deeply fulfill you and things that help other people around you. And a lot of people can't, a lot of people are struggling with just living from day to day, right? And if you can realize how little we actually need, that helps you meet your day-to-day -day struggles. It helps you pay the rent. It helps you get enough food for whatever you need, right? And I put a little asterisk here because it's really if you have enough confidence in yourself. Because if you start making changes and downsizing, you move to a smaller house, and you feel like you're going to be judged by your friends, um, then it's harder to do. So the way I deal with it is I surround myself with friends who understand, who get it. Um, some people will say that the kinds of things you do are ridiculous, and other people will say that's really cool, right? So I just try to make sure that I'm surrounding myself with the right types of people, and that communities like this help so much. 
you guys probably think I'm less weird than all my business students think I, think I am, because I tell this story about sleeping on the floor and they probably think I'm a big weirdo, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and this brings me to the last kind of point. Um, I think that when we're stuck on this hedonic treadmill, when we're running after more, running after what our neighbors have, what our friends have, what's on TV, we forget to look at all the immensely, shockingly beautiful gifts that are around us every day. They're so beautiful all around us if we just stop and look. So I just wanted to tell you a quick story. I had gone on a vacation with my friend from middle school two years ago. Um, we had gone to Turkey, super blessed that I was able to go to Turkey. And we had gone to all of the mosques and seen all of the touristy things. And we decided one day we just want to walk around and see what happens. So we walked around and we ended up kind of in a crappy part of town. It wasn't the nicest um, area. We were by a highway. And so we just kind of got tired and we're like, let's just sit down and get a, a soda or something. Mm -hmm. So we sat down at this kind of rickety cafe. And in Turkey, there are cats everywhere. They're just walking everywhere, kittens everywhere. You kind of get used to them and forget about them. <clears throat> but as we were sitting there, we ordered our soda. Um, I noticed this one kitten sitting next to us. And I had just um, finished thinking about this idea of beauty in the ordinary. And I saw this kitten and I noticed it. And I was just seeing all of these beautiful things about her. And I wanted to share it with my friend, but I was afraid, again, she's going to think I'm crazy because I knew her from middle school and I've changed a lot since then, right? I haven't spoken about these types of things with her. But I was just so moved that I just tapped her on the shoulder. I was like, her name is Shrifa. I was like, Shrifa, look at that cat. If you look at it closely, look how peaceful it looks. And if you look closely, you can see its chest rising and falling. And if you look even more carefully, you can see the fur moving in the wind. And think about all of the organs in that cat that must be working right now to keep it awake. And in the organs, each of those cells that must be working, feeding each other, breathing oxygen, whatever cells do, all of those things happening to make sure that this cat is here. Look at how cute its paws are. Look at how beautiful its little nose is. This is so beautiful, so beautiful. And I waited to hear Sharifa either be like, I don't know what you're talking about, I'm hungry, <laughs> or how she would respond. And she just kind of looked at the cat for a while, and she's like, you know, you're right. If there's anything that I take from this trip to Turkey, it's that there's beauty in the ordinary. So I was really moved by that. Beauty in the ordinary. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, oh, thanks. So this is a, the quote by Wayne Dyer, which I think really gets at the point. Um, Abundance is not something we acquire. It's not something you run after and go to the credit card, pull out your credit card for. It's something we tune into. So there are these precious, beautiful gems of things all around us at every moment, miracles all around us. You don't need the credit card. You don't need to go to the mall. It's there if you look. So Thich Nhat Han said this quote as well, which I think captures what I'm trying to say, the spirit of what I'm trying to say. So people usually consider walking on water or in thin air a miracle. But I think the real miracle is not to walk either on water or in thin air, but to walk on earth. Every day we are engaged in a miracle, which we don't even recognize. A blue sky white clouds, green leaves, the black, curious eyes of a child, our own two eyes, all is a miracle. And I think the power of enough has helped me um, tap into this truth. It's a, a deep spiritual significance to me to be able to see these miracles around me. And I think this power of enough has really helped me start tuning into that. So I wanted to end with a seven minute video. I don't know if I, I hope, sorry, I, have, I hope I haven't gone over time, but I'm just going to show this, this brief video. video. Good? Okay. So do we get the lights? <laughs> so I was just going to summarize that um, happiness is more about what you do and how you think that's about what you have. And the power of enough helps you um, get off that hedonic treadmill, helps you notice the beauty in the ordinary. Um, and I think it's a very powerful kind of practice. So thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, thank you.